We're going to trigger the Alpine Stars Tech Air system, but we're doing it manually. You, this cannot be done in normal circumstances. We have a lead from the back of the airbag system to the laptop where Jenny is over there, and she is going to trigger it and it will go off and you'll be able to see what it's like when the airbag goes off. She's only going to trigger it when I say now. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I didn't say now. I said you trigger it when I say now and I haven't said now. <laughs> the Adventure Bike Shop, proud sponsors of Adventure Bike TV. <laughs> Rubbish adverts. Greater adventure. Hello and welcome to Adventure Bike TV. Now this month is a very special month because it's my birthday. So for those of you who are watching this at the start of the month, all presents welcome. If you're watching this later in the month, what the hell was my present? Anyway, of course, as always, we're going to start with a bike review. But this month, it's something a little bit special. We're going to be answering a question which is one of the most commonly asked questions that we ever get. Our handles are spring-loaded to ensure they don't rattle, reducing noise when riding. Metal Mule. Engineered to be different. Proud sponsors of the bike reviews on Adventure Bike TV. Okay, so you see in front of me a KTM 1090 Adventure R, but do not worry, we are not reviewing this bike. I know we've done it already. What we're doing this month is reviewing probably the most important thing about adventure bike riding outside of choosing your bike, and that's your choice of tyres. So we've got five sets of adventure tyres. So by adventure tyres, we mean tyres that can do 50% on-road, 50% off-road. And to help me with this, I've got... Mark Molyneux, who does our yeah. adventure bike riding tips. So Mark, just talk us through the types of tyres we've got for the review today. Okay, well we've got five sets of tyres um, supplied to us by Cambrian Tyres and Trelly Sport. They've helped us out on the test, which is really good of them. We couldn't have done it without them. Um, on the bike is the new Anlas Capra X. I've never even ridden a bike with these on, so it's going to mm. be interesting. Um, also, to follow that, we've got... Um, the Mitas Dakar E09. We've got the Pirelli Dakar R. We've got the Carew 3s and the trusty TKC 80s. So, very varied through their designs. Um, and I think it's going to be very interesting to answer the question that's the most asked here. What's the best tyres? We don't know. So, in terms of trying to give them the most thorough workout we can, yeah. just talk us through the test that you've devised okay. for us. Well, what we've got We've got um, a 10 mile off-road test, which will take us around a third of Sweet Lamb, and that will take us out down onto the A44. From the A44, we'll head into Hafod, Devil's Bridge, do a loop around the dams all on the road, um, and then make our way back in off the 44 again and do the 10 mile test again. So it's gonna take us a while. We could be out up to two hours doing this test, and we've got to do that five times. So, um, there we are. Fantastic. And just to make this test the most realistic we possibly could, we added one more element into it. We decided to test in the rain. Now, why might you ask have we decided to test in the rain and on the wet roads and the wet trails? Well, I think it'd be fair to say that any of these tyres on dry roads in the sun, they're going to be pretty good and pretty hard to tell the difference between. However, ride them in the rain and it's going to make the differences between them seem that big. Um, we've just come back in from testing the Capra X by Anlas. Um, overall on the road, I was quite surprised how good it was. It did feel good and it's hammering down with rain. Still steered nicely, good on the brakes, held a line in the corner very well, even though we were trying just to cook in it a little bit, but it still, it still was very, very good. And now we've adjusted the tyre pressures and we've put more of an off-road tyre pressure in, which I know a lot of people 
don't like the idea of knocking tire pressures out, but the, the difference in the bike is chalk and cheese. It's really interesting because Mark and I come at this from two very, very different angles. Uh, Mark's instructor, lifetime enduro rider, motocross. He's used to going fast with lots of grip all the time. I spend 95% of my time riding on tarmac trying to find that grip, and only probably 5% of my time off-road. So I'm coming from the bottom, understanding more grip compared to what I'm used to. That bike was a different uh, animal with the tyre pressures, softer. I found with the hard tyre pressures it felt very woody and the suspension felt a lot hard, there was no give in the tyres at all. Now Lee's knocked them back down to uh, 25, 20, uh, 25, 20. Um, there's a lot more feel, the bike stops faster, there's a little bit more grip um, and it actually steers a little bit slower but it actually steers as accurate. Um, overall, at trail ride speed, they are, they're really good, very impressed. On the road, the same, very good. Here's the sheets, what's, um, what's Molly's scores? You're not allowed to know. The point of the test is that you do it on your own, you can't check other people's answers. Fair oh, so you're just not going to fill it in? <laughs> <laughs> yep. Pit crew today, big green, Tire changing machine, the green. <laughs> and his dad Pat, who's my instructor here at Sweet Lamp. Um, can't say enough about these guys. Absolutely golden people. It's the first time I've ever had a pit crew. And to be able to ride into a garage and the two guys there waiting to do everything for you. <laughs> what can I say? Thanks guys. It's extremely wet. I think it's about the wettest I've been. It's, it's unbelievable. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, Carew 3, on the road, very blocky. It did feel extremely blocky. Um, didn't really enjoy it too much. And the capper had got a little bit more feel out the corner. I felt the Carew was just a little bit, got a little bit of movement. Plus, I had the red light on a couple of times, so it's spinning out the corners. So, it wasn't. You know, I didn't want to push it any more than that. Um, when we came back and dropped the tyre pressures out, uh, with those tyre pressures on, it feels less blocky, but uh, the controllability is more. It's more predictable, it will slide longer. So if you were just like trail riding tyre for tyre, there's not a lot between them. But when you push the Karoo, it will come to you and it will stay where you want it on the throttle. So if you're on the throttle hard and you're sliding it, it will stay there whereas the capper didn't want to stay, he just wanted to go. If you take a close look at the tyre, Pat's just picked it out. When this tyre's come back in, and it's pouring with rain, it's actually drying out in the centre of the block around the tyre. So there is some heat getting into this tyre, even though it's wet. So obviously the compound of the tyre is, um, is different to the others. You can actually see it coming to that tyre. It's surprised me quite how much of a difference I felt in the first two tyres, both on the tarmac and on the trails. So when I came past the car, I was overtaking it, giving it some beans, and with the Carew, the wheel was really, really spinning up, which first of all, I thought might be down to the fact that I was crossing the white lines in the middle of the road, so they're a lot more slippery. So I tried it again without those, same thing, and exactly the same thing on the trails. The difference was incredible. I'm not quite sure exactly why, but I do have a theory. So this is the Capra X. And if you look at the tread of this, it's alternating and there's big gaps between the tread and the middle. So I couldn't really feel much of a difference, particularly turning in the front. I just don't think I'm a skilled enough rider. But what I could feel off-road, pulling away hard and pulling around corners, was this gripping far, far better. The Capra gripping far better in the corners than the crew, because the crew's has much, much less space in the middle, so it's got far less kind of digging grip, so to speak. Can't wait to see what the rest of them are like. Just come back from the road.
road riding from riding the Pirellis. Um, I just couldn't fault them on the road. Um, I thought they were brilliant. No tyre noise or very, very little of it. Lovely feel, turns into the corners nice. Uh, it, it's just like riding the road bike. It, it, it is that good, the feel's superb. Um, and that's all I can say about it really, it just feels that good. For me, so far on three, top, joint top on the road, so far. Um, okay, I've just this minute gone off the bike, the Pirelli uh, rallies, ours. Um, uh, I don't know what to say really, it's just, I've tried to ride every bike the same, I've tried to be the same, and I've tried to do the same things wherever I've been on the same bike. Um, that was quite scary. Um, I've overshot two corners, uh, no reaction when you shut off the throttle. Um, didn't even attempt the grass, just, just came off at the bottom of the grass. I'm sorry, but I, I, I can't see anything other than a gravel road. That's about a lot with that tire. Um, I couldn't get up the grass. I certainly wouldn't take it down the grass. I wouldn't even chance it. Um, I don't think that's about enough said with it, really. So, I've been riding the pretty Scorpion STR with a lot of tire pressures uh, off on the trails. Obviously, it's better than riding it with the higher tire pressures. But it's still not got a lot of grip, particularly when you go anything muddy, grassy. I mean, the gravel is, is, is still not great, but muddier, grassier, really, really, really slippery, which particularly came out when I was doing a little run out the gully, where there's lots and lots of mud to get out. I mean, it was just spinning, 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 probably more so than any other wheel, uh, any other tyre that we've used so far. So uh, I think actually the gully probably said it all. I just remembered there was one other little bit, uh, an example of where um, my lack of grip on this tyre almost cost me the rear end. And next to the farm gates at Sweetland, we've got what's called the easy overs. So if you can imagine a cattle grid shaped like that, so a sheep can't get over it, but a bike can ride over it rather than the gate. Went over one of those, normally not a problem. Sometimes give it a little bit of juice on the far side of it just to move up the hill. Rear end. Straight out, not quite dropping it. What can I say? Right, end of day one, three tyres down. Tomorrow yeah. we've got which ones? Uh, TKC 80s tomorrow and the Mytas E09 Dakars. Okay, yeah. and weather forecast for us, about the same as the same. Yeah. yeah, wet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, which is good because we're going to be comparing. Uh, that's right a good now. comparison, yeah, 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 that's fair. So, good day's work, time for yeah, shower yeah. and food. Shower and food, bring right. it on, yeah. Our revolutionary patented Q-Fit attachment system allows panniers to be removed and fitted in under 5 seconds. Metal Mule. Engineered to be different. Proud sponsors of the bike reviews on Adventure Bike TV. Right, I had the most fantastic couple of days doing that bike test and the second part is going to be a little bit later in the show. Now it's time for Under the Visor and we've got a travel writer who writes only about one country and not only does he write about it but he draws it. Don't ride here. Ride here. Explore new horizons with Moto Freight. Proud sponsors of Under the Visor. So I'm Duncan Goff and once upon a time I worked in feature film, theatre, designer, cabinet maker and I used to build kitchens and almost everything and I did a bit of guided touring and I also have always loved to travel. Uh, imbibed it with my mother's milk probably because although I was born in Wimbledon I was then at the age of two I was plucked off and put down in a hundred acres of bush in Rhodesia. So I never had a pair of shoes until I was five years old and uh, I've always traveled and gone to interesting places but the first time I went to Spain in 1981, my parents had built a house near Ronda and I just felt at home. And ever since then, I've had this draw to go back to Spain. And over the years, I've spent a lot of time traveling it. Partly because although I have worked and 
lived, I, I, I lived in Greece, I've worked in Italy, France, Germany, um, Scotland, in a lot of different places. But what I started realizing, when I was doing other work, I might only have a week off. And where are you gonna go in a week to experience something? Well, I went to Spain and I started, sometimes I then got two weeks or three weeks, but I still wanted to go to the sun, to a place. And I started to realize that actually spending a little bit more time in a country and becoming more aware of the language, the culture, and the cultural differences between one part of Spain and another part of Spain were really worthwhile and very enriching. Whereas zooming across six countries, you get no real feel for the, for the language or the particular cultural attitudes of that particular country that you're going through. So it's kind of bringing, learning more that then enriches my own experience. Well, from, from an early, my father was an artist and he taught me to, to try and sketch things. And so from an early age, what I started with, I, would, I, I like to carry a sketchbook. He said, oh, well, you doodle anywhere. So for instance, um, these were doodles I did in Cordoba. Now they're, they're kind of basic, that probably take me 20 or 25 minutes. I have no claim to being an artist. I can't really draw people. So sometimes I do the most crude sort of doodle. But the point is, A, I stop and look for something to draw, and two, I write something when I do it. And it's one of the principles for me of travel. Every time I stop for a cup of coffee, do a doodle, write something, and you get those moments through the day if you stop at the end of the day to write about it, you won't remember those little moments all the way through the day. So doing it, working it that way, for me, means that I have a richer journal, a richer part of it. And it is, oh, I had that albondigas and it was just too hot. Or I had the chaos. Chaos is um, boiled intestine. But you can have nice boiled intestine and, and, and kind of rough boiled intestine. So... Um, <laughs> You know, I make little notes like that. that that's what you put into it. Uh, yes, um, well, three new books last month. Um, the first of which uh, is extracts from all the years of my journals. So I've got the pictures, the sketches, and a translation of my writing in the corners and the stories behind them. And then I've started on a series which is really about the Catalan Pyrenees. And it started because I met a lot of people who said they were going from the Biscay ports to Barcelona. And they said they were going through Zaragoza. And I know the bottom of the Ebro Valley is, is a deadly dull place to travel. So I started off, oh well, I'll write a book about the back roads to Barcelona. And this turned out when I got into the Catalan Pyrenees to actually be how to go to the Catalan Pyrenees. And if you want Barcelona, <laughs> you can just drop down there. It's easy enough. So that, this is the first one in that. Um, and then I'm doing, this is a series of seven books. Each book will cover around 100 kilometers of the Catalan Pyrenees. There is a great, um, Motorisma is part of the Catalan Tourist Board and it's a dedicated to motorcycle tourism. So they have a fantastic website, loads of routes, you can download the GPS, they've talked to accommodation and campsites that all are very welcoming to bikers. Um, great organization. So I'm, but their routes are kind of short routes. I'm doing a tour of the Catalan Pyrenees in seven books. And um, part of it is that I like to do things visually rather than just use the sat nav. So, so this is the first 40 kilometers of this route from Le Sud de Gale to Touchen. And as you can see from the map, possibly, um, is that it's got quite a few wiggles in it. Those, those are my three new books and I'm off to Spain very shortly to work on the next thousand kilometers of those routes and doing the drawings and the sketches to go with them. I do, it is a question that, that, that people ask me about it, but it, it, it comes back to my philosophy that even if, even if you're going to go around the world or you're going to Morocco, Spain is the geographical and cultural bridge between Northern Europe and Africa and Arabia. So 
if you want to start, go for two weeks in Spain and actually practice traveling into little villages, trying to understand what goes on in those villages. You will see once you stop and look and just spend your time doing it, you will find that that lady there always goes to the front of the queue in the supermarket. She must be somebody who's special in this village. So that might be somebody either to talk to or somebody you don't want to piss off or be rude to or anything else. Or it can be, there's all sorts of little cultural things that you can pick up and Spain is a good place to pick that up. I mean, how do you spot a brothel in Spain? Now, if you get a motel that's a block out of the town and there's a bit of dirt growth, you know, it's a block out from the other buildings and maybe the car park is a bit weedy. It might have a, have a, 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 a fence around the outside. The other key thing is if it's got any kind of pink sign, which might say club, disco, it might even be a pink motel sign, that is a brothel. They're perfectly legal in Spain, but the first motel you arrive to in a Spanish town might not be the one to book into. Partly because I have traveled a lot in the rest of the world. Um, and so, I have an awareness that I would love to go back to Africa. I can't afford to go back to Africa. Having been brought up there, I would love to go back to what is now Zimbabwe. When I was 18, I went to work on a sugarcane farm in Zululand. Uh, I've climbed Mount Kenya. Um, but it's for me, when I've got those short times, and maybe when I finish writing travel books about Spain, I will do South America. It would make sense because of the Spanish. And I would still, I would love to do all that extra traveling, but it's what can I achieve at the age of 61 um, in a new career as a writer? What can I achieve? So what I find in Spain is that I'm continually learning more about it. And it's such a rich experience and the people that I meet. Last year, I did, a, did right the way around across to, Can, Can, to Catalonia down through Valencia, down to Andalusia and back. And I think I only paid for one place to stay because I now know people or there's a little, um, I, there's, a, there's one campsite where the lady was very nice. I gave her a book and she fixed the computer so that now whenever I stay in that campsite, I never get charged. <laughs> and that's been going on for like six years. <laughs> so I just turn up there and, oh. I mean, she's not there, but they, when they type me in, I'm free. So that's, yeah, that's one of the things that I get from really indulging myself in learning about a country, a culture, a language, and the things that are there. And to go back to why I talk about Spain, it's because I see this, this is a bridge. If you're going to travel around the world, don't start off with not being able to get a handle on the culture and society that you pass, pass through. Even if it's only three days you're taking to go through Croatia, there are things you can learn. In Croatia, the tip is that people know where you come from by the style of your leather jacket. So the best place to go is to my website, which is www.duncan-spanish-travel.com. And uh, I have a Facebook page as well, which you can find me on as Duncan Goff. Um, there's, there's two Facebook pages. And then I do events and I'm around and about and uh, you might bump into me on a ferry on the way to Spain. <laughs> Don't ride here. Ride here. Explore new horizons with Moto Freight. Proud sponsors of Under the Visor. Now we're back with Molly for this month's top riding tip. On this month's top riding tips, we're going to be doing my absolute favourite, which is riding in ruts and probably even some muddy ruts. So, yeah. come on. How can I get away from being scared all the time about ruts? Well, it's everybody's first hate. As soon as we mention ruts, everybody's heads drop and they go, oh my lord, 
Okay. It's not as difficult as you may think. Particularly if you're on an adventure bike, you've got a little bit more weight to drive you through. You can have a nice standing position. Looking to your exit is key and driving through. You can start feet up. Most people don't finish feet up. But if you have to sit down, make sure that you sit down and you can cover the back brake. That's important. If you've got both feet dangling all over the place, you're reliant on the front brake. Too much front brake, you'll tuck the bike, you're in trouble. Yeah. So we've got, um, we've got a good selection for you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think you'll find it some fun. Yeah, I'm actually looking forward to this one. Yeah, I know you are. Kind of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right then, we'll be go. fine. <laughs> okay, let's go. Okay, Graham, grass ruts, everybody's nightmare. There's several different lines through here, yeah. but once you choose a line, stay on it and look to your exit. Try and use the clutch to keep us moving along, but momentum is key. Okay. These are very slippy, yep. and as you can see, they're all grass, so there is not a lot of grip. Yeah. So momentum is king today. Yeah, okay. Yeah. As they're grass filled, they probably don't look too deep, but actually when you step into it, there's quite a big dip there. Yeah. <laughs> Oh boy, oh boy, these are really tricky. You need to be looking a long way in front and see if you can just keep moving the bike forward. They're deep up here, so you need to keep moving, keep the bike driving and drive out. See what happens when you stop, you dig in, you haven't got the traction. That's why <laughs> momentum is so key on this game. Get moving, get your feet up. Feet up, mate, nice. Now look ahead, look where you're going. Keep the bike moving, that is first class. Keep the bike moving, keep it driving. Well done, Graham, nice. Keep that up. Well done, mate. Just a quick reminder to everybody that, yeah, this is a hints and tips section of Adventure Bike TV doesn't for one second replace coming to a training school like Sweet Lamb. However, just following those few hints and tips, again, I never thought I'd get through those ruts, but managed to by keeping my eyes ahead, you know, a bit more clutch, a bit more momentum. So, great big thumbs up from me. Thank you for that. You did great, mate. Yeah. Next month, we're gonna be riding up hills. In December, we've got something rather special happening to Adventure Bike TV. If you want to see a little bit about it, watch the teaser in the advert break. The Adventure Bike Shop, proud sponsors of Adventure Bike TV. Rubbish adverts. Greater adventure. Where is my mind? Adventure Bike Shop, proud sponsors of Adventure Bike TV. Rubbish adverts. Greater adventure. Welcome back. Now we are unbelievably excited about the changes coming to Adventure Bike TV. It is the single biggest change we have ever, ever had. But now it's the conclusion to the tire test.
One secure cam lock secures both the lid and the pannier to the bike. Metal Mule. Engineered to be different. Proud sponsors of the bike reviews on Adventure Bike TV. It's the start of day two, and the most important thing to mention this morning is the weather. Yep. Because it's exactly the same as it was yesterday, so the test is going to be a real fair one, same conditions, both sets of tyres. Yeah, absolutely. Days. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a good thing. Yeah. yeah. It didn't rain much during the night, no. so it hasn't sort of got it really soaked. It's just started this morning, so it's going to be it's a the same thing. as yesterday, yeah. really. Yeah. Be so, a, yeah. Real fair comparison. Yeah. Right from the uh, outset when we were doing these tests, I've created some very, very um, specific points where I've been testing things in, in my head. So for instance, there's points on the trails where um, I'm turning the corner, there's a very sharp corner, there's other points where there's corners that are much wider and sweeping, where I really put on the power through the corner. So there's very specific points where I can make comparisons, and the same on the road. So for me, it's turning out of a corner or accelerating in a straight line to feel how much grip and is the rear wheel spinning up. And try as I might with the TKC80, I could not get that rear wheel to spin up on the tarmac. Come, just come back now from the uh, TKC80, the tyre that everybody wants to beat, I guess. So, uh, take some beating because that's one hell of a tyre. TKC80 with proper tyre pressures in. <laughs> ah, just a different bike. Um, a lot of feel, very predictable. Um, when it slides, you can just keep it there. It's brilliant under braking, it stays nice when you're braking. Uh, went up the grass hill, no problem at all. Turn around, came back down, nice and controlled. Had a few moments, because now it's cutting up and it really is quite slick. Um, but generally, it's gonna be the one to beat. This is a very interesting one. So. I was having a right hoot at the time, and there were a couple of points, reasonably early on, when I was thinking, I feel like I'm floating a little bit. Am I getting the same grip that I thought I would get from this tire? And I worked out why. It's because I was going so much faster. I just had the confidence to go a lot faster and actually work with the, the handlebars floating around a little bit. Because actually, the grip was there, I was just going a lot faster. I just got back from doing the Mitus E09 on the road and uh, interestingly what I found is as I was rolling into corners actually it was really smooth as you roll the bike over I think the, the profile of the tyre must be affecting that so that was really nice but spin up exiting a corner on the straights um, not as bad as the Carew but not as good as the other three just come back from the Mitre C09 with the high tyre pressures. Did feel very blocky on the road, I must say. Um, probably two or three hundred miles and knocked the corners off it. But um, off road, uh, it was impressive. Um, down the back, it was pulling over 90 miles an hour, stable as anything. It was beautiful. It did the grass easy. In fact, I could have probably changed gear. But one thing I noticed more than anything off road is the stopping distance was probably 30 feet shorter than anything else, which uh, is done at the same speed, same thing. Um, that is super impressive. It just instills you with confidence. It holds a line very, very, very well. Um, at the end of the airstrip into the left-hander, it's, it's sublime, it's beautiful. Okay, the EO9's off-road with the lower tire pressures. Um, 
Definite cut above the Carew and the Pirelli. Uh, definitely not as good as the TKC80s. Against the Kappa X's, closer. More difficult for me to draw that comparison with my skill level. But it was, it was slipperier in places. So I think I put it just below the Kappa X. So it is crunch time. Two days of testing, five sets of tires, a lot of riding, a lot of rain. So over the last two days, we have been filling in these forms. Now, what we've got on these is overall feel, overall feedback, feel under braking, and corner grip level, that's across road and off road. We've got grip on gravel roads, grip on mud, grip on grass, an overall road feeling, and then overall confidence. What we haven't done is shared between <laughs> us any of the scores, any of our thoughts. So everything that we're going to talk about now and the scores behind me is brand new. Yeah, we've not even seen no. any of it, no. And I cannot describe how hard That's it has been. That's ridiculous. Because <laughs> <laughs> the first thing you want to do when you come back from out riding is go, oh, what about this and what about that? And yeah, we, not been Tom's, able to. Tom's no. pushing this into separate rooms. No, <laughs> we, we have been told. So... Um, one kind of overall thing for me that I'm just wondering that I might see in the scoring is potentially, because of Molly's experience, might he see a kind of a, his, his breadth of scoring, just knowing how I scored stuff, would that be broader because he can feel differences far, far more than me? I, yeah. I don't know until I turn around. Any kind of, kind of overall thoughts for you, Molly? Um, I was just blown away on how good they all were off-road, uh, um, on the road, mm. sorry. I mean, yeah. off-road, they were, they were much of a muchness as well, but on the road, they were stunning. Yeah. Actually, mean, yeah well, in the wet, stunning. I, I'd agree. I mean, I was really, really surprised how much grip they gave yeah. me, and that was really wet. I mean, I, it, it was, was standing it was, water in yeah, places. Standing water. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Incredible, yeah. really. Me too. Um, yeah. yeah. Right, well, moment of truth. Should we turn yeah, around yeah. and have a look? Yeah, have a look? Okay. okay. Mm. <laughs> Tom, just remind us. Wow. Which is, what's the colours? I'm red, he's black. Yeah, okay. Uh, Hang on a minute. <laughs> I'm red, you're black. Well. Well. So what do you think? There's a big you discrepancy know? between <laughs> some of those, isn't there? <laughs> yeah. My lord. So now that we've had a chance to immediately digest at least some of these numbers, let me just quickly explain what they mean. So scores in black are Molly, scores in red are mine. Totals on the right-hand side, reds in black circles is the combined totals. So I think the easiest place is to start at the, kind of the extremes. Now, the one that's got the highest combined score is the TKC80. So that was my highest score. It's Molly's second, because your highest score was the E09 Dakar. Yeah. So let's just talk about that tar first. Yeah. Um, I thought they were equal all the way through. I couldn't split them. The only thing that I chose, the, the E09 over the uh, Continental, was the braking. Mm. I was blown away by the brake. At very high speed, it stopped faster than any other tyre. Right. Um, and was very stable in doing so. So that's why I marked it up. Yeah, which um, is probably something I, I wouldn't have enough feel no, for that. That's no, no, one of the things no. I found hardest was to feel I know, it's the a very difficult breaking. thing. Yeah. yeah, it is difficult. Yeah, um, but, I, but the, the confidence it gave me off-road, and, and I said in the commentary much earlier, yeah. I felt at one point like I was floating a little bit, and yeah, I, yeah. it was only because I was going so much so faster. faster. <laughs> but that's a confidence thing, Because it was giving it? me confidence. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah definitely. Yeah. So... Okay, so that's interesting. So you, so you found it hard to kind of split the TKC and the, yeah. the E09. Um, they were very good. Yeah, and actually, I mean, it was, it was my third highest score, so we weren't, we weren't that far no, different. No, we weren't. I'm, I'm looking at the, that one there. Yeah. Um, that's because I think I tried to get that tyre up, up the green hill. Yeah. And it was never going to go up. Yeah. And you were trying it on the side of the road, so there's two different levels of grass test. Yeah. Um, there was only two tyres going to go up there anyway and did. Yeah. And that was it. Yeah. So the lowest score, the joint lowest score, was the Scorpion Rally. Yeah. So what were your thoughts on that? Um, <laughs> I thought it was a road bike tyre with a slot cut in it, personally. Yeah. Um, yeah. And actually, you look at the score, 
Yeah, yeah. We both marked it really high in terms of, yeah. uh, of a tarmac score. Yeah. That was great on the road. Mm. It felt like a road bike. It was brilliant. But um, off-road, I just struggled yeah. constantly. Yeah. Uh, and, when, and, we, and when you look at the block shapes, yeah. great big blocks in the middle. Yeah. yeah, nice shape to them, so which is why I felt good on tarmac, I think. Yeah, but it was good on tarmac. It was excellent on tarmac, but braking was good, it was stable, and, but off-road, it was scary. Yeah. Um, I didn't want to slate anything, but it, it was time to shut off. Yeah. You know, really yeah. was. Yeah, I, my view would be, if you're going to go somewhere where it is nearly all tarmac, and yeah, just fine. kind of a bit of gravel, far track, no problem. fine. Yeah. But anything beyond gravel, dry gravel, far tracks. No, thanks. No. 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 Okay. So, yeah, okay. So just looking at kind of where we've scored the, the biggest kind of differences, we scored quite differently on the, on the Dakar, although yeah. it was my second and it was your third. So yeah. maybe actually our kind of view overall was very similar. Yeah. But we scored quite differently on the Crew 3. On the Crew 3, yeah. Yeah, yeah and that's, that's... I quite liked it. I, liked, I like its grip levels. I did like its grip levels, mm. um, and I had a lot of feel from it. It gave me a lot of feel, um, and I liked, I liked it straight away, particularly when we had the softer tyre pressures in it. took away the rumble, and, and, it, and it was nice. So I, I actually thought it was a, a good tyre. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, I think actually that's probably the only one really yeah, where, 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 where we're really, really split. Yeah, yeah. I quite like the feel of yeah. it. I don't mind the movement of it, but... Yeah, mm. I, I think that, that was probably it for me. For that that movement, yeah, just didn't block. didn't inspire any confidence no, no, in me no. at all. Um, I had the I had the rev limiter light on that tire more than anything. Yeah. That overtaking, it was spinning up a little bit more, but the conditions have been appalling for all of them, yeah. and they all didn't do it. Yeah, I, I think I don't it, know. I mean, for me, it was it was it's the the road just killed it for me. You know? yeah. I just it didn't inspire any confidence. No. Um, well, in, in comparison to the others. Yeah. yeah. I mean, as we've said before, on the tarmac, they were all They were exceptionally good. good. I couldn't good believe how good they all were, really. Yeah. Um, they, they were, I, I couldn't fault any of them on mm. the tarmac at all. Yeah. Nothing. So in, in terms of um, or the scores, I yeah. would say the winner is the TKC80. But actually, I mean, you could actually say my winner was TKC80, yours was a Dakar. Yeah. Joint first, maybe? Probably. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, it's, it, this test came about because, you know, I was unhappy with the TKC80 and I found, <laughs> I found up, you know, saying I need something better than that. And um, this is how this all came about and through Trelly Sport and, and uh, Continental um, Graham Matcham. And they helped us with the test. And isn't it amazing that a bike is, that the tyre is, I don't know how old a tyre is. It, it's been it, around for donkeys. It's been around for yeah. donkeys, but it's still there. Yeah. And it's still good. So the day they crack that out, out of the mould, they've got to be very pleased. Yeah. And things have moved on, and that tyre's moved with it. And, and you've got to say, it's still good. Absolutely. It's yeah. still good. So just two more things before we wrap up. So costs. Now, so difficult to kind of get accurate costs because no matter where you go, you can always find a deal for, some, for something. So what we did was we took the prices from a single supplier on the web to compare the costs. Um, I mean, there's 20 quid difference between the bottom and the top one. The other one, and it's a question that I know everyone will be asking, is about where. Which of these tyres is going to last longest? Yeah. And it's something that we actually, that is probably one of the things we had talked it's about. It's the thing we did speak about to start, because the start it's, of the test. It's an impossible question you to can't answer. Do it. Yeah. Yeah. You're yeah. going to have people that are slight, large, two up, one up, camping gear, no camping gear. It, the, the parameters are just so far apart, you, you, you couldn't get it. No, I mean, I, 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 I know people who've taken, I'm not going to say which one of these tyres, but one of these tyres and they've ridden it hard and it's lasted 800 miles. Yep. Somebody else has lasted 4,500. Yep. And you, so, you as you said, you can't yeah, do it. the weather, the heat, how yeah, hard you're riding, off-road, yeah. on-road. There's too many variables to make that an accurate thing. And I know that's what everybody's going to harp on about probably, but it's the, that's the fact. The fact of it is, you know, different people, get different tyre life. That's as simple as that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank okay. you. It's been a cracking weekend. Yeah, it has. Cheers. Yeah, cheers. No parts intrude into the Max Pannier. This ensures every inch of space can be used. Metal Mule. Engineered to be different. Proud sponsors of the bike reviews on Adventure Bike TV. You know what? That was, I think, a really 
thorough, thorough test in conditions that you don't normally see these sort of tyres tested in. And in the end, a conclusion that actually we both came to a very, very close one in the end. Now it's time for adventure advice with Claire. Hi there and welcome to Adventure Advice, your monthly AA meeting with me, Claire from Expedition 52 and today we have Roddy with us from Motor Freight. Hello Roddy! Hi! <laughs> Um, because, as you know, we are currently talking about shipping and trying to prepare you the best we can so you can get your bike prepared and shipped as economically and easily as possible. So today, we are specifically talking to Roddy about how to prepare your bike before it even gets crated, packed and sent away. And you're going to go through a little bit with us of what people can do prior to them coming here or when they get here, what they need to do to get it ready for crating. So where would you start? One of the questions we're always asked are, can I leave my personal goods with the bike? My clothes, my luggage, of my course. bones. And it saves on taking on the plane. Yeah. Now, what we say to people, everything has a value, has a market value that can, you can claim on if something goes wrong. Except your personal effects, you cannot because there's no, you can't prove they were there. So. You leave them there at your own risk. Most people right. do, but it's 100% at your own risk. Okay. Because another reason is luggage must be left unlocked for customs to inspect. That makes sense. Um, when you prep the bike, when we pack the bike, we like the luggage to be detachable. The top box panniers have to come off, save space, put them down by the side of the crate. Um, okay. Normally bubble wrap, but the customs might inspect them. Yep. So make sure everything's mm. unlocked mm. and released and yep. able to come off the yep. bike. Right. Um, if you have a tall screen, yeah. uh, we'd like to remove it, um, or if you have a screen extension, otherwise we just lower the, the screen to save a bit of uh, space. Okay. Um, we like the bike in for air freight, um, quarter tank of fuel or less. Uh, for I'm sea guessing freight. for obvious reasons. Um, it's all to do with expansion because you might have a three litre tank on a C90. Okay which a quarter tank is almost impossible to measure. <laughs> okay. Or you might have a GSA with a 33 litre tank, but it's still a quarter tank for uh, gas expansion. Okay, and so the air freight quarter tank for sure. Air freight, no more than quarter tank. Sea freight, they like it uh, drained or as little as possible. And okay. for sea freight, the battery must be disconnected. Okay. Um, so with regards to that, if you're wanting to put like personal belongings and stuff, I know you've put this tie here for us because you wanted to talk to us about taking on brand new tyres and things like this. So why is it that we have this here? Is there something that we well, miss out on? People can take tyres with them. And if you see, if a customs officer on arrival sees a tyre, it's yep. in his head, yes, it's a spare tyre. Most people have a spare tyre. What we suggest is, before you do that, remove any labels that suggest that you might be smuggling on any items that you're taking in. Um, your all personal goods. If it's in a brand new wrapper, customs see it as importing. Ah, so they're going to expect you to pay duties and stuff. They could well. You might get an awkward customs officer. Best to put stuff into old plastic bags and take labels off. Right. Okay then. And then with regards to sending things out, is there like a weight limit of what goes into a crated box or? Uh, there's no weight limit except for Buenos Aires, they charge on destination charges, a charge on the actual weight. Right. Uh, which is a break point of 350 kilos. The, the cost almost double when it goes over 350 kilos. So. Our crate weighs 60 to 70 kilos. Your bike will weigh 230 to 250. Okay. So luggage, your best, any heavy luggage, certainly taken on the plane with you, you'll save a lot of money. Yeah, I guess then you don't want to pay additional charges the other side. Yeah, that it's happens. cheaper to take it on the plane with you, if, unless you want the convenience <laughs> and are prepared to <laughs> pay for it, of course. Of if, course. Then, uh, so another question we get asked quite frequently, and I know you guys are interested to know more, is getting your bike over to, say, Australia. What's the kind of cleanliness or how clean does a bike need to be and what, what's the kind of issues you might encounter getting your bike over to Australia? For Australia and New Zealand, the bikes have to be absolutely spotless. They will go for quarantine inspection. If they fail quarantine inspection, they're looking for dirt, insects, eggs, insects, eggs, or anything like that. Okay. Um, if they fail, you pay for cleaning and re-inspection, which can be 
add up to more than five hundred dollars between them. <whistles> it's not worth it. Nope. Um, so it's best to make sure your bike's absolutely spotless, air filters spotless, under the seat, between the bash plates, rear huggers must be spotless. Those are the places they look. Do the best you can in essence. Yeah. And if you're taking any camping equipment, they most certainly will um, disinfect it. So you will pay oh, for that. Really? So like where people can store extra stuff, so camping yeah. equipment like tents, sleeping bags, yeah. you don't put them in the crate if they're heading over to Australia or R New Zealand. Rather buy or them avoid it. They're, they're cheaper. Plan, plan ahead, buy, find the shops, go online, find the shop over there before buying new here. A great tip. I wouldn't have known that. Yeah. So uh, it was something you would just ordinarily yeah. throw in. Yeah. Even brand new, do you think they would do that as well? There's a if suspicion? it's unsealed, brand new, then you might you get might... the awkward customs officer, but you'll pass quarantine. Okay. Well, that, that's, that's always a positive. So yeah. in general, it seems relatively simple. Everything must be detachable, as clean as possible, some generic kind of packing things. Really great tip on making sure you don't get paid any customer duty fees. Is there anything else that we should really think about on preparing the bike before it comes here? Or One of the other things is if you're going to altitude, um, we check tyre pressures if we're sending a bike to altitude. Uh, say okay. Bogota, 8,000 feet above sea level, Flagstaff, Johannesburg, also very high. Um, if you've pumped your tyres to the perfect, temp uh, perfect pressure here, yeah. uh, we're almost at sea level. Right. Um, those, ah, so it's going to go up, right? Those places, the ambient pressure, at atmospheric pressure is 15% lower than here. So your tyres will be overinflated. And that's not going to do any good to your tyres before you, you get there. You make your bike very skittish on the road. <laughs> <laughs> so to check that also once you arrive? Once you or? arrive, yeah, we'll, change, we'll drop the pressure a little bit here if we're sending you bike to altitude. Okay. Uh, but yeah, recheck. When you, t you have to fill up the fuel, yep. check your tyres. Don't assume they'll be right. And I guess it's the same when they come back as well. From somewhere high altitude back here, the tyres are going to be flatter, right? So yeah, be prepared to pump be, them up. That would be pre pretty obvious. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you pretty much know. Well, yeah. that's fantastic. Is there anything else that you think we know we need to know about that? Or have we covered the basics that you think will get us I there? I think we've covered the, the, big, the, the most of it. Um, fantastic. Different destinations might have different, for different people, different horses for courses. Yes, of course. Ask, they can ask the questions. Exactly. So if you do have any additional questions, Roddy, Kathy, Tim, anyone from Motor Freight are more than happy to help you. So do give them a buzz and ask those questions. Alternatively, you can give us a call at Expedition 52 as well. We work very closely with this team because they're awesome. Um, so we can try and help find out any questions as well. But thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Roddy, for your time. My pleasure. And uh, yeah, we look forward to seeing you on the next segment. Tatty bye. Bye. So bye. awkward. Tatty bye. Tatty bye. All right. <laughs> bye then. <laughs>Now it's time for bike build and wasn't it just something extra special last month where we actually saw them doing some actual building? So uh, I do hope they will continue with some more building this month. Roll it, Sam and Tom. Okay, hello and welcome to this month's bike build. Hello. We are outside because it's actually nice weather. So we've got out of the gloomy shed yeah. and the horrible rain. And today we are concentrating on the rally bike, the rally beast. Uh, at the end of last episode, you saw us unboxing all the kit we got from Aurora Rally. Mm -hmm. um, lovely, lovely kit. Oof. Very exciting. So it's time to get it on the bike. Now, we don't know how far we'll get today because obviously we need to strip most of the front end down. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then start trying to bit, get everything back on, all the electrics back in and things wow, like that. Wow, so pulling out wires. A lot of wires. I don't know. We'll soon find out. The issue we have with this KTM screen is that it is made of the most fragile thing known to man. So you have to be very careful about over-tightening it, otherwise it can crack at these points here. So. And as always, something that looks doesn't look this expensive when you come to buy it from the kitchen. Wow. That's really was, fragile. Isn't it? <laughs> a comedic value there. <laughs>
the next part is to take these side panels off, um, which is fairly straightforward. And then after that, it becomes a bit more difficult. We're removing the side panels and we won't be using these again um, because as we showed in the previously in the kit, it actually comes with a set of um, side panels which we'll need to drill holes in. We'll be using the screws though. So it's very easy to kind of just pull this off and forget that there is a, there are a few connections here. For instance, the indicator wire here and also the breather hose, which goes to the, goes to the tank. So it's just a question of unplugging both of those. There we go. Now we've taken the side panels off. Um, you can see the plethora of wires which we'll have to deal with at some point. Um, so once we take the light shroud off, or the light housing, sorry, um, we're going to get a proper idea of what we're dealing with. At what point do we start looking at the, uh, the manual? For what? What do you mean for what? For the rally kit? No, no, for baking the pie. Don't be a dick. <laughs> Okay, so as you can probably tell from the shadow, which is slowly creeping up the side of the bike, um, we're kind of getting on in the day now. We've taken the main bits off. What we're trying to do now is there is such a mass of wires and things under here yeah. that they all need to be kind of looked at and work out where they're going to go on the new tower, etc. Uh, which is... It's a bit daunting. It is a bit daunting because there are so many wires in there and... You know, and you're trying to work out where they'll go. I mean, the new towers, the instructions are pretty good, yeah. to be fair, yeah. that, um, that they've been sent through. Um, only downside is there'd be a nightmare to print out because they're all on black backgrounds. Yeah. Uh, so you don't want to print them out, put them on a tablet or something and read them off there because <laughs> otherwise you'll use all your ink up. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, the, the, the instructions are pretty clear. It's just a bit daunting, isn't it? Yeah, I think, I think for anyone who hasn't done anything like this before, it, it can be a bit kind of bit of a showstopper but you know give it a whirl why not so as sam works on all the electrics it's important to remember that one of the first things he did that we didn't bother putting on camera is disconnect the battery uh, whenever you're working on bikes and the electrics and things like that you know you're probably not going to die from uh, electric shock from motorcycle but it's not going to be very pleasant and you can end up shorting things out and causing yourself all sorts of problems later on so just make sure when you are doing stuff like this play about the electric on the bike always disconnect the battery first isn't that right sam yes safety tom it certainly is get my little uh, high vis <laughs> vest <laughs> and my my helmet <laughs> we're coming to the point now where we're taking we've got to take the front tower off the original OEM tower off the bike but um, before we do that I just want to disconnect the speedo um, so we can I we can move Wait a that second then. I just said about doing that and you're like no why would you do that oh, the and then if you'd listen to me instead of just flapping your lips again I I said no as a matter of fact I might just do that I'll be honest with you, each one of these, yeah, I have no idea where they go to. So it's going to be fun trying to put them back together. Um, but what we'll do is we'll definitely give this a, a bit of a, a clean up. I mean, yeah, there's a lot more wires on it than, say, the 690, which I've been playing with. So we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Okay, so we've stripped everything down. So it's all the bare wires, everything ready for the tower to mount. Yep. Now, the next thing we're going to do is I understand we're going to we're going to bolt the tower on. Now it's not ready to kind of finish at this yeah. point. There's still bits we have to put in there. Yeah. But we're going to bolt it on now mainly to make sure that we can kind of get an idea of where things go, make sure the wires are all going to be long enough for where they need to go, because yeah. the ignition's going to get fully relocated kind of quite high up here, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Um, so we've got to make, doubly make sure about this, because at the moment it's a bit tight, so um, we'll have to have a look, see how, how, how much wire we've got to play with. So. Okay, so if we bolt that on now, yeah. and then we can start to have a look, and then on the next episode we can... Uh, Start putting things actually in place. Yes. Yes. Cool. So exciting times. <laughs> Come on, push it in. Yes, but you're... See, yeah. when it makes noises like that, it's not good. 
There. There. Little silly. There, go. Now. Oh, get it in. Push it. Oh, push it real good. <laughs> okay, so here is the rally tower mounted. I mean, yeah, we, we've got to take it off again to to kind of get everything. But what we're trying to do is work out whether, you know, the wire's long enough to get in there. We can't, for the life of us at the moment, work out where the ECU is going to go. No. And we've had a look at the instructions, but I think we just need to have a proper read, proper of, read of the instructions. We're doing a man thing, aren't we? Yeah. Um, but it does look cool. But then, you know, you're going to have... This is going to go on here like this. It's going to look all cool. And then Sam holds that. Then this here. It's going to go here. Oh. It's going to look so good. So good. Really cool. exciting. Really, yeah, really. I shouldn't just throw bits. You just throw it in there. Yeah, but it, it was into a box of... Wrap. It could be in a box of bubble wrap. <laughs> it was in a box hiding of... sharks <laughs> and leopards and hyenas. Okay, I apologise. That was a silly thing to do. <laughs> so yeah. join us next month. Yep. Where we will be basically putting this all together. Putting the the ignition goes in here. You have another bit that kind of bolts on here, which is going to have your um, your speedo and everything like that on. There's some lights to go in. Obviously, the lights need to be wired up. Work out where another ECU goes. <laughs> and make it all look amazing also um this is great because the indicators go inside it don't they yeah so yeah. your indicators are protected as well so there's still lots to do so we'll see you next month see you later okay so uh, that does count as some um, building and that rally kit is extra special it is something else so i'm just a little bit incy wincy jealous of that one anyway it's the end of the show we will see you next month Adventure Bike Shop, proud sponsors of Adventure Bike TV. Rubbish adverts. Greater Adventure.